This is Vern Benham Grimsley, on campus. In 25 words or less, what is the purpose of life? To seek and find and do the will of God. Prove it. That's less. Prove it. Why should I believe you? <laughs> hey, I mean, you know, you're just a cat who's standing there. I mean, you, you dress nicely and you've got, you know, a fairly good education. You can quote from all sorts of people, but uh, give, me some, give me some demonstrable proof I can put in my laboratory. It's the laboratory of my personal human experience, oh, which testifies what you mean is, is what true. you mean is the purpose of your life is God. But I didn't, that wasn't the question. The question was, what is the purpose of life a priority for, yeah. for everything that lives? And all, all it's because you did I was found something. Your personal opinion of what happened to you told you what was right for you. But that wasn't answering the question. What right have you got to tell me what the purpose of my life is? Well, maybe I could describe it comparatively this way. Suppose I find a new dish at one of the campus restaurants around here, and it's very good. And I try it, and you haven't tried it. And I tell you, you ought to go to such and so greasy spoon and you ought to order number three because it's superb and I'm sure you've never tasted it before and you say what gives you the right to tell me that number three is superb and all I can do is say well because I tasted it and I liked it and it's same with knowing God with this sense of spiritual discovery and being a child of God I can say I've tasted it discovered it that it's meaningful and I would therefore want to share it with anybody uh, in my opinion what has gone throughout the history of man under the label of religion is uh, not absolutely worthless. It's made several, several thousand people rich and fat, but uh, for the most part, uh, of little use to the average man, other than as a sop to his conscience. He can always go home and get on his knees and pray for forgiveness instead of actually rolling up his shirt sleeves and doing something. In the first place, you're talking about the average man as if there were such a thing. According to the teachings of Jesus, each person is an individual, is unique, is irreplaceable in all the vast universe, is a child of God. Yeah, but the thing is, I don't want to be a child of anyone. I'm a man. All of us are related to each other, you know. Whether you, you know, whether you set a Chinaman next to an African, next to a European. The you interesting know, far, thing, though, is that people are not living that out. True. That's the question. In other True. words, True. by the theories which have been propounded so far down through history of brotherhood, all we can do is say that people have sort of nodded their heads to it and gone on stabbing one another in the back. By this spiritual power, as Jesus taught it of brotherhood, a person is able actually to love his brother you for the first time finish, in history. Did you? you did let me finish. Now, uh, my point is this, I am capable of accepting the brotherhood of all men uh, without postulating the fatherhood of a anthropomorphic deity. Uh, now, the brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God seems to me like a bunch of people under a very fat pink thumb shoving them down. Uh, you know, uh, you must all be... You must become as little children and you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, what I'm saying is that it's not necessarily a bad thing to be a child of God. I think it's a very positive and a very constructive thing. In my own personal experience, as a child, I many times sought the superior wisdom of my earthly father. I in, every word you say. In the, true wisdom. the understanding of how I ought to meet my problems and so forth. In the same sense, now that I've become a man, this doesn't mean that I have suddenly somehow been inculcated with all wisdom and all knowledge, and I still need to seek this higher wisdom. Only this time I'm turning to God himself, all right. who has wisdom for uh, man. Uh, what do you mean exactly? I'm talking in very broad terms, not necessarily of any specific denomination or sect, but the general love of God and man, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, no, this I planet... I fatherhood of God because, it's, you see, it's a term that was created by people, and the religion brought a lot of trouble to the world. Has it not also brought some of the highest art, for example? Much of the great art has been religious, much of the great poetry, music has been religious. Has it not also... There's a lot of art that was stimulated religion the way, you know, we see it today, if you look in history, brought to only trouble. For example, take an Albert Schweitzer going off to Africa to spend decades and decades serving people and healing them and making them well. Would that be an example of religion making nothing but trouble in the world? Well, take, take the Inquisition, take the Crusaders, <laughs> take, uh, <laughs> you know, the Middle Ages, take... I will grant there are bad things, but it has not at least brought nothing but trouble. You can at least find some things where it has brought... Religious brought a lot of good things to the world, you know, charity and... Yeah. Uh, Someone has pointed out he's never seen an atheist's orphan's home. <laughs> I happen to be a religionist, and the reason I am is my own experience and my own exhilaration of finding myself to be... believing myself to be a child of God, all men to be children of God, and all men to be brothers. I think these two very fundamental, very simple concepts have the power literally to change the world if people would believe them. If every man were able to see himself as a son of God and see consequently everyone else as a brother, that this is a fantastic, incredible basis for changing this world and making it a family. Why do we have to change the world? I, mean, I, th <laughs> well, I have to change the world? Yeah.
What, what's, what's wrong with it? Well, <laughs> you know, seeing his invention of... Give an example, give an example. In World War I, over 8 million people died. In World War II, over 14 million, according to the historians. That's one thing that's wrong with the world. I think no, that we're close not... To 100 million. Close to 100. Give your own figures, but in any case, too many, I think, we'd agree. And I think that... Religion is a kind of dogma. Well, my conviction is that the reason religion can change the world is that religion can change people, and people can change the world. In other words, that it can bring about an interior transformation. People need to change in terms of finding a new sense of self-respect of their own divine dignity as children of God. I think that many people have a craving for an alteration in their lives to find a new sense of meaning and value personally themselves. And I do think that to believe themselves by faith to be children of God and brothers to men can bring that about. And I find it to be a very joyous and happy thing. I think most people are drifting away because uh, I know I have. You've drifted away from religion yeah. personally? I go to religious school, but I don't uh, believe in any of the Christian uh, uh, documents. In other words, I don't see how they can uh, distinguish the valid validity of the Bible between any other of the uh, great religious books in the world. What about some of the basic teachings of Jesus, such as the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, that this planet is one family and we ought to start living that way, and stopping right there and not debating anything else, do you think that's a valuable idea? Yeah, I think Jesus was a pretty good uh, philosopher. But you think there is great meaning in some of his basic teachings, such yeah. as the man is a child of God? Yeah, like uh, brotherhood and all that. Yeah. But not necessarily, uh, he sort of got carried away toward the end of his life, like uh, turning the other cheek and all that, you know. I think that could change the world. I think turning the other cheek is a very valuable idea because I think it means repaying evil done to you with goodness. The whole problem of the world today, isn't it, is that people are repaying evil done to them with more evil and so you have more and more yeah, violence. That's a point, but uh, I think it can be carried to extreme, you know, and uh, that's where it's, uh, Particularly when, uh, a it's right. when a Christian master says to his Christian slave, right, right. Um, turn the other cheek. Can you, what do you think he means by resist, resist not evil? Tell me what you think then. I think he means resist not evil, and if I were to finish the sentence, it's almost as if there were a misplaced period there, in my own opinion. Resist not evil with evil. I think he was strongly preaching against retaliation. That is to say, meeting violence with violence, the negativistic ethic of force against force. If somebody does you dirty, you go do him dirty, only twice as dirty, and pretty soon you end up, both of you standing there tweaking each other's noses and pulling the buttons off each other's shirts, you know? And Jesus simply saw the futility of this. He was saying, overcome evil with good, that there's a spiritual power available to each human being within himself by this Spirit of God which is in every one of us, by means of which we can draw on the power to do good to someone. As Jesus said, love your enemies, bless those who persecute you, who hate you, pray for those who despitefully use you. That is an enormous unleashing of spiritual energy when a person begins to live by that high concept. One important point that needs to be made is that when Jesus taught this way of spiritual peace, of love, of compassion, of the brotherhood of man beneath the fatherhood of God, he was not talking about something simple. He was not talking about any bed of roses. There are hard decisions to be made. It takes, I'd say, more manly courage and more authentic spunk to live by these spiritual principles as Jesus said one time, to be able to forgive a person 70 times 7 instead of wanting to hit him back right between the front teeth, that's pretty easy, really. That's a fairly simple solution. The kind of spunk that I admire is the sort demonstrated by the person who's able to love in the midst of tremendous violence being done against him. And I know someone's going to say, well, that's weakness, that this is not the solution. People have been lying down and taking things for far too long. It's time that they stand up and fight. I think it's time we have a spiritual renaissance on this planet and begin to live by these spiritual principles and recognize that within each one of us, there's something of God himself, and that gives us a divine kind of dignity so that you don't want to hurt another person. You don't want to exploit him. True, but that's all very true, but only a few people are capable of living in that, that, that way. I think a great many people, I think all people are really capable. It's been 2,000 years since the Christian message was laid down, and it's been like a, uh, something like 500 years more that the Buddhist message was laid down, and people are still doing it, you know, and they're doing it, and it's part of our national policy of America, and uh, I, uh, I, I agree with you that, uh, that uh, to, to, to tap higher energies, to live a spiritual life is, uh, is very desirable, but the idea that you're going to have a spiritual renaissance and turn everybody onto it and, and we're going to love each other, uh-uh, <laughs> no, later for that. Well, of course, if a person takes this idea, this attitude toward it right away, that it's patently impossible on the very face of it, then of course we're never going to have it. It's, not po it's possible for, for individuals to, to, to profit, sure, but, but if you expect to change society, you'll be disappointed. I'm sure that if Jonas Salk had taken the same attitude toward the possibility of ever developing a 
polio vaccine, we would not have a polio vaccine yet. The very fact that it's possible to be so negative about the possibility of anything, to relegate it to the realm of being a fairy tale, that this planet can never live spiritually as a brotherhood, that of course, if we're convinced of that, we cannot conceivably live it out. But if we would dare to believe that we're children of God, that there is a higher power available by means of which we can love, then I'm convinced it can come to pass. And maybe it just always takes in every generation a few people who are willing to hold this ideal before people, to hold this dream before people. This was the dream of Jesus. It was the highest dream, I think, of Buddha, the highest dream of Lao Tse and of Confucius. And it's a dream which must not die today of a spiritual renaissance. If we let it die, then the finest hope this world has ever known has died. The hope that this planet can be a family, the brotherhood of man beneath the fatherhood of God. So your idea then is that, that um, if people see that, that violence won't work, that eventually they'll see uh, a hope through this, through the spiritual rebirth or renaissance? Or I don't know how long it takes people to learn that violence doesn't work. And in fact, judging from the simple statistics of war, the fact that we have so many wars, someone computed that there have only been a few hundred years in all world history when there's not been war going on, maybe people don't learn this lesson in the negative sense. Maybe just by going to war, they don't learn that violence doesn't solve things. Maybe the only solution is finally going to be some people daring to live by these higher principles, by spiritual values. And that's a mighty choice. Abraham Lincoln, in the midst of the Civil War, one time said, his question was not so much whether God was on his side as whether he was on God's side. Any individual, any person can have this tremendous transcendent sense of being used by loftier purposes and energies than his own. And then, to his own amazement, he finds himself able to love in a new and thrilling way, finds himself able to show compassion that he didn't think he could show before, to do good to those who do evil to him, that it really works. You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701, and ask for the publication, Questions University Students Ask. This is a booklet of actual word-for-word -word question and answer seminars held outdoors on major college and university campuses. Here are some of the subjects treated in this free booklet. What definition would you give of God? What does prayer accomplish? How can faith in God actually change the world? Is it possible to end warfare and bring peace on earth and goodwill among men? What about science and religion? Are they utterly irreconcilable? And how is it possible to experience God, to feel the presence of God in one's daily, day-to-day -day life? If you're interested in these sorts of questions, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701, and ask for questions university students ask. And for those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out the mailing address. It's Box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. I've also written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, and Freedom from Fear. For any or all of this literature, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.